president of the Metric Coordinating Council of Parent Associations, the NSCCPA, along with the six North Shore Parent Organizations Executive Boards, welcome you to meet the candidates tonight. The Coordinating Council is pleased to host this event annually and procure the Nassau County League of Women Voters to moderate, thereby providing the community a forum to meet and learn more about the backgrounds, experiences, and accomplishments of our candidates for trustee. This forum also importantly provides an opportunity for you, our community members, to ask questions regarding the candidates' knowledge, stances, and goals about issues that are pertinent to this district that you find most important. Coordinating Council encourages everyone in attendance here tonight to do so, whether you do so by the writing your questions on the index cards that were given to you that will be collected, or whether you would like to come up to the microphone and ask your question. The League of Women Voters moderator will further explain the process and procedures that we will follow. Are Herman Berliner and Antoinette Labadi here in attendance? Where is Antoinette Labadi? Um, at this time, let us thank Herman Berliner for his dedicated service as Board of Ed Trustee for the past nine years as well as Antoinette Labadi for her dedicated service as Board of Ed Trustee for the past six years. <laughs> Tonight's Meet the Candidates Night will be recorded, and the recording will be available for listening and viewing through the North Shore High School and Glenwood Landing parent organization websites. I'd like to take this time to thank Andrea McCary, Timothy Madden, Anthony Stanko, and Lisa Vizza for stepping forward to pursue a position on the board, especially as we are embracing our new dear superintendent, Peter Girozzo. And in light of the ever increasing outside challenges public education faces. Candidates, we appreciate your interest in ensuring and advocating for the best possible educational opportunities and outcomes for all of our students while considering the concerns of all of the residents of the North Shore community. At this time, I would like to introduce the members of the League of Women Voters who join us this evening. Judy Epstein, she will be our timekeeper. <laughs> Francine Furtado and Judy Jacobson will be vetting the questions. And lastly, our new moderator, after many years, who I'm sure is going to do an excellent job, Michelle Lombardi. I will now hand the podium over to Michelle. Good evening, and thank you for coming to the North Shore School Board of Education Candidates Forum. I want to thank Denise Reiner, President of the North Shore Coordinating Council of Parent Associations, for all her hard work to make this evening possible. She has earned a round of applause. <laughs> I am Michelle Lombardi from the Port Washington Manhasset League of Women Voters, and I will be your moderator tonight. League rules state that the moderator may not come from the town represented by the candidates. I am from Port Washington. Judy Epstein, who will be our timekeeper, also lives in Port Washington, and our vetters, Francine Furtado and Judy Jacobson, also come from outside of your district. I want to make a brief public relations pitch for the League of Women Voters and tell you about our goals. We work to inform the electorate about candidates' views on issues through forums such as this and through a variety of publications. We register voters at community events. We are a nonpartisan organization, which means we never support a candidate, although we do take positions on issues after studying them. We hope you will consider taking a membership brochure, either for you or a member of your family. And remember, the League of Women Voters is not for women only. Mm -hmm. I will now read the rules and procedures for the evening. 
After that, I will read a short biography of each candidate and call on him or her for an opening statement. We will then be open to questions. Please hold your applause until after the closing statements. We want to maximize the time for questions. Questioners who would like to use the microphone may line up behind it, and that's over at the podium where Denise was. Um, please state your name before asking a question, and we will intersperse questions from the microphone with questions from the card. If we run out of um, questioners at the microphone, we'll switch to the card questions. Procedures for the League of Women Voters candidates meeting. The moderator will be a member of the League of Women Voters from outside the district. Candidates for the office, for the same office, will draw lots to determine the order of speaking, and we've done so. Cards will be distributed by volunteers from the North Shore Coordinating Council of Parent Associations. Cards will be collected by these volunteers and vetted by League members to assure that they are legible and not repetitive or abusive. Questions must, and please write your name on the cards uh, in case we have a problem reading them. Questions must be confined to the issues in the campaign. The questioner should make sure that their questions require one minute or less to read or state. They'll be timing the questions so we can get more answers. Um, each candidate will be allowed three minutes for an opening statement. After all candidates have spoken, the moderator will alternate between reading questions from the cards and allowing questions at the microphone. Questions may be addressed to a specific candidate or the candidates in general, but all candidates will be given an opportunity to answer every question. Each candidate will be given one and a half minutes to answer a question. There will be no rebuttal. A league member will act as timekeeper. The timekeeper will hold up a sign indicating when 30 seconds remain, the yellow sign, and again when time is up, the red card. Uh, when the time is up, the speaker will be allowed to finish his or her sentence. Since, uh, and as I said before, questioners should write their name on the card or state their name when they come up to the microphone to ask a question. Since the purpose of the meeting is to determine the candidate's views, no substitute speakers will be allowed to appear should the candidate be unable to attend. Each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. The use of props, charts, or visuals, and the distribution of campaign literature is prohibited. And in accordance with league policy, audio taping or videotaping by authorized members of the media will be, will be permitted only if agreed to by all the candidates present. No other taping will be allowed. And a brief reminder to please turn off your cell phones. And we will move to opening statements. Um, so Mr. Madden actually drew the first straw. Um, so Timothy Madden is running for a three-year term as a North Shore District, a North Shore School District Board of Education trustee. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Tufts University, and then a Master of Arts degree in, in American History from Hunter College. He works as a high school social studies teacher and is also the co-founder, co-editor, and writer for a local online newspaper. Mr. Madden has written extensively about the North Shore schools and a wide variety of local issues. Mr. Madden served as a trustee on the board of the Northport East Northport Union Free School District from 2009 to 2010. In addition, he was a member of the North Shore Central School District Legislative Action Committee from the fall of 2011 until the summer of 2015. From 2006 until 2008, Mr. Madden worked as an adjunct professor at the Ammon School of Education at Adelphi University. Let us please welcome Timothy Madden. Well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for um, presiding over this event, and thank you, Denise Ryman, for putting this together. And of course, um, my fellow candidates up here, and of course, all of you for, for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Tim Madden, and I believe I have a great deal to contribute to the North Shore School District and community as a school board trustee. I have a well rounded and unique perspective on public schooling policy and governance that has developed out of having served and worked in a variety of positions in education for more than two decades and reporting on local boards and issues through NorthWorldViews.com and the newspaper serving the communities of the North Shore School District. 
these experiences, in addition to my being a parent of three children who attend our schools and a taxpayer, have enabled me to gain public education and revenue goals through many different lenses. As far as educational philosophy, I am what you call an education speak and constructivist. We learn through experience by going and observing and trying to make sense of the world around us. It is a social and collaborative process where we are bouncing ideas off of each other. Schooling that fosters these experiences promotes creativity, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, socialization, and a love of learning. The skills and attributes that will enable our students to adapt and thrive in our rapidly changing world and to be constructive citizens in our democracy. Additionally, I believe that we must have a rich program of extracurricular activities allowing students to experiment and pursue and develop their interests, whether it is through the arts, various technology programs, athletics, or other areas. My government philosophy has been shaped through my experience as a school board member in Northport and as a reporter for Northport News. I've learned that the most constructive and valuable trustees on any governing board are not those who share my point of view on every issue or even on most issues. They are the ones that understand the importance of process and open deliberation in making policy. They are the ones who seek and welcome input from a wide variety of stakeholders rather than promoting policies based solely on their own personal experience. There are those who understand that good policy develops out of a clash of ideas and civil discourse, and they are the ones who are flexible and have the intellectual honesty to change their own positions on issues when the data, evidence, and arguments point them in another direction. I am also very mindful of the challenges facing taxpayers. I am a taxpayer and a father of three children, ages 11, 14, and 16. The oldest of whom is taking the SATs for the first time this Saturday. A clear harbinger of the financial pressures my family will be facing over the next decade. Mm -hmm. I am very much aware of the challenges taxpayers face across the island and the ones that are unique to this district, in particular as a result of predatory and water company practices and a persistent power and utility that continues to try to push its tax obligation onto district residents. Again, thank you for coming tonight, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, and our next candidate is Andrea McCarran. Um, she's running for a three-year term as a trustee of the North Shore School District Board of Education. Dr. McCarran earned a Bachelor of Arts Magna Cum Laude from Barnard College of Columbia University. She then completed a Master's of Arts degree with distinction in psychology from Hofstra, followed by a dual PhD in clinical and school psychology. She's, a board, she's board certified in behavioral and cognitive psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychologists. Dr. McCary works as an associate professor of psychology at Suffolk Community College and as a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Manasset. She also conducts research in the area of pedagogical innovation and suicide. As a community volunteer, Dr. McCary served as Secretary of the Legislative Action Committee appointed by the Board of Education, as a member of the Shared Decision-Making Committee, and as a member of the Five-Year Strategic Planning Committee. She is also Chair of Suffolk SUNY General Education Committee for Psychology 101. Let us please welcome Dr. Andrew McCary. Thank you for having me here tonight. I have to admit it, it's strange to be here. This is the school where I spent so much time, made so many friends, learned so much. Sometimes it feels when I'm sitting in this room during board meetings that I never really left. But it's actually been 22 years since I graduated from North Shore District, and a lot has changed. Childhood has changed. What's noticeable to me is the push down academic climate that students, teachers, and parents are contending with. Kindergarteners are expected to read, second graders are expected to multiply, and third, fourth, and fifth graders are expected to take tests and tests and tests. As academic demands have increased, gifts of childhood like free play are on the decline. Adolescence has changed too. Our middle schoolers and high schoolers are navigating new terrains like social media and substance abuse. As a clinical psychologist, I see the effects of this every day in my private practice. As a psychology professor, I see something else too. 
the transition from high school to young adulthood is a turbulent one. Whether a student is going to college, a trade school, the military, the world has ever-changing expectations on them. And in order to succeed, our students need to be ready to meet those expectations with the appropriate skills in place. So that's why I'm here tonight. We can make a difference as a community in the social, emotional, and academic development of all our children. Real solutions exist, and the solutions are evidence-based, they're high impact, they're low cost, and they're often easy to implement. But we need somebody on the board with a background in child development. We need someone who's willing to lead this cause to make this a priority. I want to be that person. Let's face it, we're privileged living in this community with great schools. I know firsthand the benefits of a North Shore education. In fact, that's why I returned so my daughter could have the same opportunities that I had. And as a mom, I see that she is. Elmer is in second grade now, and I'm continually amazed by the innovative programming happening around her. She has 10 years left in this district. I am invested in the long-term success of our schools, not just for my daughter, but for all of our children with all needs of all ages. So tonight, I look forward to sharing with you some specific ways I hope to do this. And I hope by the end of the night, I will not only earn your trust, but I'll earn your vote as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCary. Um, and our next candidate is Lisa Vizza, and she is also seeking a three-year position as a trustee in the North Shore School District Board of Education. Ms. Vizza earned a Bachelor of Business Administration from the Hofstra University School of Business. She then completed a Master of Social Work at Adelphi University School of Social Work. She presently works as a social worker and therapist. Ms. Vizza has been deeply involved with the schools in the North Shore community. She has served as co-president of the North Shore Coordinating Council of Parent Associations, president of the North Shore Special Education Parent Teacher Association, vice president of the high school PTO, member of the Legislative Action Committee, parent member of the Committees on Special Education, and the Preschool Education Independent Review Committee. She is also a member of the parent sector of the North Shore Coalition Against Substance Abuse. In addition, she holds leadership roles in the local civic association and is a trustee of the Nicholas J. Vizza Foundation for Pediatric Cardiology at St. Francis Hospital. We believe that her extensive volunteer work has given her insight into how the North Shore School System works. Please let us welcome Lisa Vizza. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, I'm Lisa Vizza, and I'm a candidate for trustee for the North Shore Schools. Before I begin, I too would like to thank Denise Reiner, co-president of the North Shore Coordinating Council of Parent Organizations, along with Ms. Jacobson and the League of Women Voters who are here. She has coordinated this entire event, which is no small feat to organize. I know, I've done it before, um, but she had to do it alone this, this go around. So thank you to Denise Reiner. I'd also like to recognize our current board president, Tony Labati, and former president of the board, Dr. Herman Berliner, who actually in the past um, was my dean at the Hofstra School of Business. So he's, he's a leader and a teacher, and he continues to teach me. Um, and finally, thank you to Andrea, Tim, Anthony, um, for coming out and stepping forward to take on the task of campaigning for trustee. It's no easy task, but each day has been a good day so far, meeting and talking to families and neighbors during this process. And at the end of it, I know it will have been worth the time spent doing just that. My reasons for running for trustee position are varied and are primarily informed by the following aspects of my life and experiences. I am a longtime resident and a graduate of this district growing up in Seacliff, with a, with a, within a family, we valued service back to the community. My father was a 60-year member of the Seacliff Fire Department, as was my grandfather. He didn't spend that, that amount of time, but he was also uh, a member of the fire department. For many years, my mother was active in and served um, 
as a Meals on Wheels volunteer, delivering meals to our seniors and homebound neighbors. My father then accompanied her on her mission when he retired from a 30-year career with the North Shore Schools. They were my first models of unconditional and purposeful service to our community, and I hope that I'm a model for my own children as they pursue their own avenues of service. Over the past 15 years, my participation in school building-centered and district-based activities and initiatives has been extremely varied and deep. They include leadership roles in multiple parent organizations, namely the president of the Special Education PTA, a team member of the Legislative Action Committee, the Athletic Policy Committee, um, the Special Education Independent Review Committee, parent member of the Committee on Special Ed and Preschool Education, and shared decision-making among others. Throughout that time, I've learned so much from working with, listening to, and learning from others in our shared work. My parent peers, administration, faculty, staff, neighbors, and students, and experiencing how people can truly accomplish a great deal as a collaborative group with a unifying purpose, that of enriching the lives of students during their time here at North Shore. As the district embarks on a new strategic initiative focusing on focused on propelling the mission of the North Shore Schools forward, I would like to apply the professional skills that I've cultivated over the last 30 years to continue my work in a deeper way by becoming a trustee of the North Shore School Board of Education. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And our next candidate is Anthony Ustanko. He is also running for a four-year term as a North Shore School District Board of Education trustee. Mr. Ustanko earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from the State University of New York at Geneseo and then graduated with a Juris Doctor degree from West Virginia University's College of Law. He is now semi-retired doing work in real estate investment, management, and legal services. He has formerly worked as a real estate agent, a youth drug abuse outreach program coordinator, a carpenter and contractor, and as a teacher. He worked as a substitute teacher, a full-time private school teacher, and a full-time public school teacher. As a volunteer, Mr. Stanko taught CCD at St. Barnabas Martyr Catholic Church in Seacrest. He also served as the clerk at Martha's Vineyard's Meeting of Friends in Massachusetts and started a water quality group there focusing on the impact of septic systems on the drinking water. In addition, he was on the Glenwood Elementary School Nutrition Committee. Let us welcome Anthony Stanko. Well, I want to thank the people that put this together and all of you for coming tonight. And the other candidates, I want to tell you, I'm certain they have more passion than I do for, for, for being elected. And I just want to acknowledge that immediately because I know they have a real heart to serve the community. They, whatever's burning within them, I can feel it. Uh, I was mentioned I'm a Quaker. And the Quakers were called queer people 300 years ago. They're different. And uh, that explains my dress tonight because we believe in plain dress. I tend to walk through the community. Half the time I look like some homeless Vietnam vet. And the reason is I see how people treat other people when they're not as fortunate. It's part of my ministry and my presence in my life. It's important to me. The Quakers are the ones that were told um, to speak truth to authority. That's where it comes from. And they had their tongues cut out and they had burning coals stuck on their tongues and they were hung in the town square. And they wouldn't tip their hats to the king or the queen or curtsy. Got them in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but we believe in equality. But five years ago, I brought some equality issues to the board. It didn't really go very far because people were worried about money issues and there's all sorts of things. But for me, it always boils down first to character, character development. There's a, a line from a movie. I, I, I think some of the women might know how this goes. Oh, they're praying for you, Kathy. What do they know of heaven and hell who know nothing of life? Nobody? <laughs> My mother came home from that uh, movie when she was a girl, and she says, I don't want to be called Lena anymore. My name's Kathy. And that was it. See? Anyway, the point being, 
when I was a teacher, whatever I was going to teach was to build character first. Character absolutely first. My point in running, and the point that I want to make to the community, which disturbs me and forces me to run, is that we have too much drug and alcohol abuse in our community. And if we were to build character, we will not have so much. And during the night, I may have a chance to expound more. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. <laughs> I'm going to also take this opportunity. There are plenty of seats in the front row and the second row, so if you'd like to come in, please feel free to, to make yourselves comfortable. Um, and we will begin with the question. Um, and if you, have a, if you have a question on a card that you'd like to be brought up, please raise it up, and Ms. Ryan will come and pick it up. Or you can bring it up yourself. Um, and we will begin the question um, portion of the evening. So we'll start first with the, at the podium. Um, and the first question will begin with Mr. Madden. So would you like to ask your question? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Maria Mosca, and I like to call myself um, either the garden mama of the secret school garden or <laughs> what's more appropriate the uh, chief waterer and weeder. <laughs> so um, my question, um, I'm sorry, it's for Mr. Madden first, is that what you said? Yeah, this will, oh, this will just affect the order in which people answer. But oh, okay, yes, because I really would be interested in hearing everyone's responses. Yes. Um, the bottom line is how would you enhance the district's STEM program, but I would just like to very briefly put that in the context of um, the work we've done uh, with the Secret School Garden uh, has been supported by our wonderful PCA raising lots and lots of money to allow us to build raised beds and uh, and a beautiful greenhouse and we spend a lot of time, um, this is our second year getting it going and it's going very, very well. But I'm interested in hearing how the Board of Education with your participation might support various, the various elementary school garden programs of which I know uh, Glenn McGlendon and, and Glenn Head are trying to do similar things. Thank you, Ms. Mosca. Thank you. And first to Mr. Madden. Yeah, I mean, are you asking specifically about the garden program? Well, in the context of improving STEM education, what we'd really like to do is get our garden program, this was the last sentence of the question, uh, more integrated into the curriculum. Where we, and we think STEM would be a place to do that. Um, I, I think that would be a very good place to do it. Um, just in, uh, with horticultural studies um, and just basic horticultural studies, I think in the early grades, um, just on plant development and germination. You know, I'm, my expertise is not in, in early education, but I think that's a natural fit. And certainly, um, as I said before, I think so my, it, what's so central to education is learning gardening. And when you are able to integrate gardening into a science program, I think that works perfectly. Um, I think there are probably some mathematical applications as well in terms of spacing out uh, plantings and design um, that might work well with, with math as well. So um, I, I see it as a natural fit. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Uh, Ms. McCarran? Thank you. Science instruction in elementary schools is actually on the decline. Um, when you think about state testing, the focus is primarily on literacy, on mathematics in our schools. Um, they get an, uh, students in elementary school get an hour a day in elementary, I'm sorry, an hour a day in math, so five hours a week. They get an hour and a half a day in literacy, right, which works out to be seven and a half hours in literacy. And when you look at how much time they're getting in science, it actually is only an hour and 40 minutes a week. Science is rotating every other day with social, su social studies. Um, so I think that's very concerning. They did research. Um, where they looked at developing a passion for science, and they found that if children were not exposed to science by the age of 10, in a way that would inspire them, they would not go on to pursue science later on. So I think what that means, Maria, is that we need to have science every day in every grade. 
And I think using the garden in that way is something that's so, so unique to seek this is one easy way to start. Thanks, Ms. Gary. And I'm going to remind the candidates, um, some people are having difficulty hearing, so when you speak, just make sure you speak very close to the microphone. Ms. Rizzo. Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. It's really good. It's interesting because I was just having a conversation with one of the principals. Maybe I'll turn up. Is the volume better now? There we go. I was just having a conversation with one of the principals, um, the, one of the schools I was visiting um, for a special ed meeting, and we were talking about um, how we might be able to engage with people like yourself, like volunteers, but also experts in the community. Um, there's a Cornell um, cooperative extension that they can push in there either no cost or low cost. Um, there's a wonderful farm called Black Camps Farm, literally a mile, not even a mile from here, where we can give these kids some, they can connect what they're doing to the to the Seacliff Garden with um, businesses, family-run businesses, and other uh, scientists and horticulturalists in the community to push out of the school building walls and see um, how those types of uh, sciences are going on in the community, and they're tangible and they're concrete, and um, kids need to sometimes break out of the walls of their, of the, of their school. So thanks for that question, Ms. Mr. and Mr. Sanko. Well, um, my grandfather had a cow on Franklin Avenue, <laughs> and the uh, Seacliff trustees at that time, uh, they had a cow also. You had to get rid of it. The thing is, uh, when I was on the nutrition committee, we talked about the garden and when we're landing. And I said, you know, I got this nice pile of manure. And they said, well, you can't bring that there because it's not from the right source. We have to buy it in special bags and this and that. Now, one of the things I really want children to learn is self-reliance and how to make manure wouldn't be that hard a job, you know, how to make compost and just to draw things from the regular community. I don't think anyone would be lacing it with arsenic. And yet that seems to be like maybe what our lawyers are telling us, we can't do that. Um, but. And I have, I would like to have an in-house counsel, by the way, just to, off on the side. But um, definitely, children should be doing these things hands-on at their level, their readiness level, and at their own inspiration, so that they really do get involved. That's a much better experience, uh, in my opinion. And it really is best when it starts with the children. Not so much from, we got an expert here to show you. There's too much of that. We are losing out because we're not letting the children grow. Thank you, Mr. Stanko. Thank you. And I'm going to read one, of, now we have a question from the cards. Um, and the first answer is going to be Ms. McCary. And the question is, what are your thoughts on the elementary school enrichment program? I think one of the issues with the enrichment program is it's not standardized across the three elementary schools. So depending on what school you go to, what teacher you have, will depend on what opportunities you are given. So in terms of the enrichment program, I think one thing that we can look at going forward is standardizing that curriculum so that students in each school get equal exposure to science and math, social justice issues. And the second thing is I have to commend the school-wide enrichment program. The, the idea that we're providing enrichment to all students, regardless of need, on a school-wide basis, I think is really special to this district and something that should be continued and supported. Thanks, Ms. McCary. Ms. Vizza? Um, I'm going to use an example from uh, my own children's experience as a friend with landing enrichment. And one of the things, it was um, very student generated. It was part of a school wide enrichment um, class. And it was um, generated by a, a really nasty, horrible looking um, uh, space courtyard in the middle of Glenwood Landing School, which is a beautiful school if you've ever been there. So the children are like, that's really nasty to look at walking by, what can we do with it? And the kids decided, and they collaborated, they're like, let's make this a, a Japanese garden. And these kids drew up the plans, they created a whole project plan, they elicited um, donations from the community, um, parents, students, all came together to clean out the, the, the space, um, and created this amazing zen-like space that 
the whole school can utilize now. Teachers bring kids out there to um, learn about Asian culture, um, just do some yoga, do some meditation, read. Um, and it was really a wonderful, wonderful example of, of a collaborative effort where they thought about it. They created a, a solution to a, a problem in their own school, and everybody took part in it, especially in the school-wide enrichment uh, context. So um, I think it's valuable. I think it should stay. Um, it brings together all the shared valued outcomes that the district has um, so keenly uh, articulated, and um, I think it's something that should remain. Thank you, Ms. Gaza. And Mr. Stanka. So, um, yeah, this type of thing plays into something that I've offered the community if I'm elected is that uh, 10 months of the year, I'll be somewhere in, in one of the buildings as a trustee to listen to anyone from the district that has concerns about what we're doing. And uh, when it comes to the enrichment programs, one thing that I think is I agree with, um, that we need more uniformity, that it would be great if the entire district could come up with a consensus as what is the best thing in the curriculum for all the children, not the children in Goldman Landing will have this and the children in Seacrest will have that. Um, that. There's something to diversity, but there's something also I think in a better educational experience when the community can decide on a single value for everyone and support that single value. It shows something for the children. Also, you can't have uh, limitless choices. And when we are always going to bank all these limitless choices, it shows that we don't have the capacity to make decisions. And I think it is, um, creates a sense of insecurity that we cannot decide. You're going to have to live. You're going to have to make a decision. It'll be yes or it'll be no, and you're going to learn to stick with it. That's a big thing of growing up and being a mature person. Thank you, Mr. Stanko. And Mr. Mammon. Um, I think the, uh, the uh, enrichment program is an excellent program uh, that promotes the sort of uh, constructivist experiential hands-on learning um, that we want to promote in our school. It, it, it encourages kids to solve problems on their own uh, with some direction from a, from a teacher, but really it's something that they're developing on their own. Um, as far as the uh, pull-out aspects of the enrichment program, I think that aspect of it, I think it assumes that that sort of education should only be available to, to a certain type of student, and it's my feeling that that sort of education should be available to all students. Um, and so that's something I would like to see more uniformity with. Um, but getting into the issue of uniformity between schools, um, I think it's important to have collaboration between the enrichment teachers uh, so that they have kind of a, a shared vision of what uh, their goals are, what, uh, what, what they want the outcomes to be. But in terms of how they get there, uh, certainly they should be sharing ideas, but the, the path that they uh, take in getting there can, be, can vary from school to school, and depending on the strengths of each individual teacher. Thank you, Mr. Madden. And now a question from the podium. Hi, I'm Lisa Colosiopo, and I'm a kindergartner, and um, one of the things that really concerns me is the push for academics and the lack of play, and my son is five years old. So I'm just curious about your opinion of the role of social, social and emotional learning. How, what, what role do you think that plays in our schools? And Ms. Lisa, you'll answer first. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, my history, and I think Andrea will agree, is um, we believe in a, a lot of play and downtime. We both sent our children to the Rise and Trinity Co-op, where it was a play-based preschool. Um, and what you gain from that is children who are able to resolve conflict on their own, figure out how to collaborate together, um, solve problems, um, learn fine motor skills and gross motor skills without a computer by going outside and engaging and actually playing in the snow. Um, so I'm a huge proponent of um, including a little bit more play, free and um, not structured play, but letting kids um, go out and, and play in a sandbox, go into the garden during recess time, um, 
kick the ball around, get some sensory input before they have to get back into the class and do their, their uh, literacy box and math box. I think you would see some um, gains in, um, I guess, the outcomes that we have, that we're expecting of our kids if we gave them a little bit more, not even a little bit more, I would say double some of their free, free time during the day. Thanks. Thanks. And Mr. Stonecrop. Uh, this goes for every grade. I used to teach math. I, t I actually taught every grade. I taught kindergarten. It was a substitute. I was in a school district every grade, every class. But I did teach mathematics, and, and when I was teaching algebra, there were a lot of times that the children were not ready for algebra. They had not uh, developed the abstract thinking mechanism within their brain, and um, they were suffering terribly. And I would just say, you're not ready for this. It's okay. But the parents might not agree. And they said, my child is not succeeding the way he should, or she should. But you would never punish the child because they didn't walk at one year exactly, or talk sufficiently well at age two. You would never think to punish them. When we set goals that are prior to the human development readiness stage, we hurt children. And we cannot ever do that so that we can wave some number in the, in the air and say, look how many of our children do this. That is just not welcome in a school that I'm involved in. Thank you, Mr. Sanko. And Mr. Manor? Um, I think uh, playing and uh, in early grades and even in, uh, throughout elementary school is absolutely essential uh, to social and emotional development. Um, there's so many, um, I mean, it, just uh, being able to, to go out in, on the playgrounds and discover things on, by oneself and on one's own um, direction rather than being directed to um, what somebody else thinks is important is absolutely essential to, to uh, a, a child's development. Um, and I think there needs to be uh, plenty of time for that in the school day. Thanks, Mr. Mann. And Ms. McCary. Thank you. I think there's a myth that you either we educate students academically or we educate them with social and emotional competencies, but the reality is, is the research is very clear that strong, robust academic programs integrate social and emotional development within it. It's obvious when we focus on social and emotional competencies, we're going to see less mental health issues, we're going to see less drug use, but I guess what's not so obvious is that we see academic benefits. Students who have social and emotional competencies, they're more likely to graduate college, they're more likely to go on to higher education, and surprisingly, they actually score higher on standardized test scores. So, SEL is important, it helps with life, it helps academics, and the best, I think the greatest news is actually, for every dollar you spend on social and emotional learning, it will yield $11 later on. So it's a no-brainer to me. Thanks, Ms. McCary. And our next question is, um, Mr. Stonko will take this question first. What is your definition of fiscal responsibility as board trustee? I don't want to waste any money. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste a penny. And I, if you go online on the board website, you'll read what I have to say about this, and as well as some other things. We have so much money to spend per student, unlike so many other school districts. I feel we just don't get enough back. When I, I'm going to talk about when I was a carpenter. You can do some quick and dirty carpentry and it's done. It's good, it, you know, as long as you follow the rules. You want to make it look a little nicer, it's going to cost twice as much. You want to make it fine, it's going to cost four times as much. You want to make it superb, 16 times as much. And, of course, I did some of that carpentry in some of these fancy houses out on the islands. But the fact is, because I was a math teacher, I could do that. Okay. <laughs> but the thing is, it costs a lot for that little tiny bit extra. But we're not getting that little tiny bit extra. We just sort of, it's like playing bridge. You, you dealt cards. Whoever plays those cards the best is the winner. You could have the worst hand, but we're sort of paying for all aces 
<laughs> and all kings and all queens, and we're not getting the result we should we should have. We have a stack deck, but we don't have the correct results. We have lots of resources that are being wasted. Thank you, Mr. Stanfield. Um, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Um, I think fiscal responsibility uh, means operating as efficiently as, as a district possibly can, which means uh, evaluating its programs uh, and um, to make sure that they are um, operating that particular way. But I think also what's essential to fiscal responsibility is to be forward looking and to consider what impact do our decisions today have on our budgets three years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, you know, the, this year in this, in this current budget, there was some discussion over the tax levy and coming below the tax levy limit and to what extent how does that impact us going forward? And when you do come below the tax levy limit, uh, it affects all future uh, tax caps. And the question is, and, it, and it's a discussion that needs to be had, is that something that we want to do? Do we want to lower it so that in future budgets, um, if the money is needed, we don't, um, we don't have that opportunity to do it. It puts us, so if we bring it down $300,000 below the limit this year, it's 300000 below every subsequent year. Um, and looking at reserves as well, um, that if you bring down the levy too low and then you're raising reserves, you get into a situation that uh, has happened in Eastport South Manor, where they did that repeatedly over about six years, and now they're cutting 71 positions. Um, so those discussions always have to be had uh, when we're looking at budgeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. I'm Mr. McCary. I think my role as a board member is to really be data-driven. Before we implement programs, I think we really need to look at what the data says about the effectiveness of those programs. And I think it's important to continually look at the data once we implement a program to see whether it's worth continuing. I also think relying on economic analyses is important. I said it before about SEL programs and how spending a dollar yields 11 later on. I think there's so much research out there that we can rely on, and to not use it effectively, I think we're really remiss. Thanks, Ms. McGarry. Ms. Bozak. Uh, my idea of fiscal responsibility, first and foremost, I can define it in three words, is not spending unnecessarily. Um, I think that um, as a the role of a board member is to respect the expertise of the educational um, professionals we have in our district to um, put forth a budget that, that is um, accurate to their needs and requirements that the state requires of us in terms of uh, uh, producing specific outcomes and funding the programs that they expect. Um, and I agree with Ms. McCarty, I think, you know, we always have to take a very cyclical review of the outcomes of the programs that we have um, right now, and whether they're doing the job for our kids and the, the outcomes are uh, positive that we see. And, um, and they relate to um, our strategic plan and our new goals that, we're, um, that we've articulated. So um, I think we can be efficient. Um, I think this is the first year of um, our new um, administrator, our new superintendent, and uh, I have confidence he's done um, an appropriate job with this particular budget, um, but we do have to be mindful of some of the landmines that are coming forward um, in terms of some outside um, activity regarding national grid. Um, American water is on everybody's mind, so understanding the things that we can control um, internally to the district and being aware and thinking um, proactively and strategically to the things that are outside of our control. Thank you. And um, the next question will be from the podium. Hello, good evening. My name is Dylan Mitchell, and the question I have for the candidates is how would you approach school safety? And Mr. Madden will take this question first. Okay. Um, I teach in high school, and I can see how um, certainly the school that I teach has responded to that issue um, after the Parkland uh, shooting a couple of months ago. And I think one of the things that's important in approaching school safety is 
letting kids understand uh, that schools are the safest places probably in our society. Um, when you look at the data, that's certainly the case, because one of the things that I see is a considerable amount of anxiety mm -hmm. among students uh, about the safety in schools and that they have to be reassured in that particular way. Um, I think it's important that there are uh, the sort of drills that certainly we're doing in, in my school, which are lockdown drills, lockout drills, shelter in place drills. Um, I think that um, students just need to be aware of what to do under, under those particular circumstances. But again, um, when we look at, uh, I'll come back to my original point, is that schools are very, are very safe places, and I'm more concerned about overdoing it and creating anxiety uh, for students. Ms. McCary. I agree with you, Tim. Absolutely. Statistically, children are safer in schools than any place else. I think we have to be prepared, we have to be proactive, but we can never be alarmist. We don't want children to be frightened coming to school. I would actually endorse, I would say, three, three main initiatives um, to address school safety. One would be increased access to mental health services. I recently participated in the core strategic planning committee and it was interesting in the high school surveys, many of the students reported that they didn't feel that they had access to mental health services here. They didn't feel that they were visible and they felt that they would be stigmatized if they did have access to that. So I think that's something very important that we have to look at. The second thing we have to look at is structural, right? What's going on structurally in this building? What can we do to make sure we, ha we close up every loophole? Um, visitor, the visitor system, I think, is one thing that's being looked at. That's a, that's a good choice. Um, and the third thing is engaging the community. Having programs that talk about gun safety, amnesty programs, I think is really important. This is not something um, that administrators can solve themselves. As a community, we have to rally together and make sure that everyone's kept safe, students, staff, everyone in these programs. Thank you. And Ms. Bizza. Yeah, I was um, very encouraged by, um, uh, after that we had experienced our own um, false alarm, um, that um, the district came together with parents and staff and administrators to um, to talk about and kind of debrief with each other about um, how they felt about the response to um, that particular event and what we could do going forward because some some um, issues were exposed that you know we walk around here and we do feel very safe and we kind of take it for granted that um, you know parents can kind of come and go and you know everybody basically knows one another so it was encouraging to see um, the collaboration amongst the schools and the community um, plus we uh, we've engaged with, um, with law enforcement and um, had an outside um, company take a look from um, you know, in a, a, another perspective where we might not see the uh, vulnerabilities in our school. Um, another thing that um, I'm concerned about is, again, this, the, the social emotional component of um, school safety. Kids are kind of on high alert now because of Parkland. And, um, you know, after a situation like um, our, our false alarm happened, kids were agitated. My own daughter um, was texting me very calmly, and you know, she was in probably the safest spot in the whole school, which was the dark room, which was a room inside a room inside a room. But we don't want our kids to be inside a room inside a room inside a room. We don't want them to go in a prison. So to give our kids some um, coping mechanisms as we instruct them in a, development, a de developmentally appropriate way about these things, um, it's the world we live in, and we're all not happy about it, and to actually give support to staff um, so that we're all on the same board when we have to enact um, either a lockdown or... So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, proud of this, I'm proud of the school for taking action on that. Thank you, Ms. Bissett. And Mr. Steinberg. I don't know if I have enough time to ask this. I, but in my legal practice, I had a, a client who um, had written a threatening letter to another student in the school about how he was going to blow the school up. And actually, um, this got to the media, and although they would not use the child's name because he was a child, and, and there would have been a lot of trouble with me, 
but <laughs> there's a, like a radio shock jock on the radio talking about this wild kid, and um, he really just was uh, a child. He was having trouble expressing his sexuality to his uh, fundamentalist uh, parents, and that's what it was, and it was being expressed that way. So we never went anywhere. I had to deal with that with the school. So we found a thing, a place to let it. So that's the threat from within, which basically we need to have an emotionally safe environment for every child in our school. Then we have the threat from without, maybe some wing nut from outside the school. And we have to put up whatever barriers are appropriate that make sense that um, would help protect our children. And that is very unlikely in Brent. But I think there should be something understood that would be in place if we had a threat from without. That's all we can do. We can't change the Second Amendment. And that's the way it is. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. Um, and the next question um, is from the card. If elected, what do you believe your responsibility is to the special education students of this district? And what are your thoughts regarding the recent changes in special education? Um, what's the name? Yeah. Ms. McCarry will be answering. Okay. Um, so just, I, what was the last question? Sure, sure. I, I can give you the question. If elected, what do you believe your responsibility is to the special education students of this district? And what are your thoughts regarding the recent changes in special education? Yeah. So one of the things I haven't mentioned is my degree is a dual PhD in clinical and school psych. And part of um, the requirements for graduation was a one year school psych internship. And believe it or not, I actually did that psych internship at, at North Shore. So I do have some exposure to the special ed services here. Um, I'm trained in psychoeducation, in assessment, behavioral intervention. So I really believe that we need to hit children with as many special ed services as we can at an early age. We owe this to them. We don't want them to struggle throughout their education. And there is a cost benefit for providing services often and early on. So that would be my primary focus. I would also want them to have all of the same opportunities that any other student would have. I also believe in universal design, and I think it's important that our schools structurally are able to meet those needs of students who might have different kinds of physical limitations. Thank you. And Ms. Vizza? Um, coming from a background of um, having my own child with a developmental disability because uh, it's very near and dear to my heart, um, and being involved so deeply in special education at North Shore, um, like Ms. McCarry, I spent a year at the North Shore Middle School um, finalizing my social work degree and, and worked with probably not the hardest population, but a challenging population of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Now, if you can remember what you were feeling like when you were 6th, 7th, and 8th grader, you will uh, you can empathize. Um, I think as um, board members, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that our special ed department is providing um, the appropriate services for our children that meet the needs of their particular um, disability or special need. Um, I know that in the past we've really done a very good job of board members actually evaluating each and every IEP that comes across their desk. Um, and I've heard about certain situations where um, a IEP did not look complete, that the CSC team was not complete, and perhaps because of that, the child might not have been receiving the services that they duly deserve. So in that particular role, I would take that on, and it would be a... Um, a privilege for me to do that. And um, again, I agree with the equity component. I think that um, uh, we, we really need to make sure that the kids are getting what they need to get um, and um, that they're getting the most appropriate services here um, so they can succeed in the future. And early intervention is very important. Um, spending. Thank you, Ms. Vesla Levy. And Mr. Stonkart. All right, well, I'll just let you know that. Um, I have a severe learning disability. It was diagnosed when I was in law school. 
In fact, it, it was called a double disability as the doctor looked at it and says, you're off the charts. My son inherited part of it, and he also was born in a foreign country where they speak a language that we don't even teach in America. And his language development was very slow, and when I was uh, here it, it initially in the secret school during a special education meeting, somebody actually uh, asked me if I thought I'd like to homeschool. <laughs> so I'm not out uh, for revenge, but I want to make sure that if you're in this district and you have a child that has special needs, you will never experience any abuse from the staff pushing you around. I'll personally make sure that that never happens to anybody again. That's one thing. That I'll never forget, let me tell you. Believe me, if this type of thing ever happens, and I'm on board with it, there'll be a head rolling. That was not a funny moment in my life. And I live also, by the way, you know, it's in my speech. People think I'm from Ohio. I was born here, okay? I just don't speak like a New Yorker. It doesn't come out that way. So I always talk. It's part of that. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. Mr. Madden. Um, I have two children with IEPs. Um, I've also, as a teacher, I've taught uh, inclusion classes uh, for several years. Um, and I think um, it's especially important that, um, with regards to IEPs, that, that Teacher, that teachers are reading the IEPs and that they have a very clear understanding of the accommodations that students are uh, receiving. Um, I also think it's important that, that th there seems to be a focus more on academic achievement with students with IEPs than um, with social development oftentimes. And, and I'll just point to the recent equity study that was um, completed last year. Um, in which there, um, it indicated that certainly the achievement gap between students uh, with IEPs and regular education students was closing, uh, but there was nothing in the equity study, there were no questions uh, to parents about um, how um, kids were, were feeling or how they were being treated in, in the classroom or how they were being treated in school, um, how they felt, to what extent they felt a sense of belongingness. That, that equity study focused on um, gender, race, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, ethnicity, which are all very important things, but I think it's also um, equally important to look at students with disabilities and how they feel um, whether or not their those needs are being met as well, whether they're feeling included in the school community. Thank you. Um, and then we're going to the next question from the podium, and Ms. Visa will answer this question first. Hi, um, this was turned up, so you can hear me. <laughs> um, I'm Jennifer Iman from Seacliff, and I have two daughters in the school district. One is going to high school next year, and the other is going into middle school. And I'm also a high school teacher on the North Shore of Long Island. Um, I am very concerned about substance abuse and how you two of you mentioned it in your opening remarks. And I'm just wondering how you plan to confront it from the school board. Thank you. Ms. Rizzo, my name. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be part of a parent sector of the um, North Shore Casa, which is just um, last year came together and it really is a problem I mean if it um, if it was a it was the answer we'd have it already for that um, in concert with um, some of my experience with special ed and um, working with some of the most highly stigmatized populations in my social work career um, I found a correlation between um, some individuals who grew up with particular learning disabilities and social emotional challenges, and they turn to substances to self-medicate. I think that it's incumbent upon us and our health, mental health staff here in district, and perhaps with some collaboration with North Shore Casa, um, that we can um, point some kids in some 
uh, specifically identify either in in house if they get good referrals to services outside. Um, and I don't want to indict any um, special ed kid that they're on the path to substance abuse, but it's a risk factor. It's a risk factor. So um, I would I would try and um, look to that and uh, make sure we have some interventions that for social and emotional growth and building of, of our student population with special needs. Thank you, Ms. Bezzard. Mr. Spanko? Just drifting off there. But yeah, thinking about it, I have a lot, there's an awful lot for me to think about on this topic. And um, I mean, I was just talking to somebody who was in rehab yesterday. And I went down to the jail today to visit somebody who just got arrested for drunk driving. And this is the way it is. And I say that we want to teach the children self-reliance and confidence. We want to have them not be consumers so much. I, I was driving through Greendale and I saw some place, I think it was Bun Tan Salon or something like that. It's like, you're going to get your bun tanned under the lights, okay? Now, in 1979, 1980, I lived on a sailboat. I went all the way down the coast and over the Bahamas and back for a whole year and a half almost. It was a long trip. I saved my money and bought the littlest boat I could afford, and that was it. I had my best friend with me. The thing is that life should give you the ability to grow and achieve your dreams, do the things you want. You can't substitute substances you know, to give you some dream. You have to live it. If we give the children enough confidence at, at, to believe in themselves, they'll be much stronger to resist drug use for the experience. And the idea of an experience economy is something that we have to grapple with. You know, you're going to pay for this experience and that experience, but this isn't what life is. Thank you, Mr. Madden. I mean, Mr. Stanko, Mr. Madden. Yeah. <laughs> Did I get you there? I, I think there are a lot of things that the district can do uh, with regards to this issue. Um, one of the things that I, that I would come back to is um, make, make sure that um, to address the alienation that many students feel when you look at that equity study um, that I had talked about before. Um, you know, one third of students and parents reported that they uh, that they don't feel a sense of belonging, um, and I think that that alienation certainly uh, contributes to an, an environment where it makes it more likely that students will go down that uh, particular path towards substance abuse. I also think that we have to have um, adequate ways, uh, adequate uh, counseling services within the school um, uh, to uh, identify students who are at risk um, and need support. And also, uh, as with regards to CASA, I think we need to um, continue our work with CASA. And uh, certainly, um, there was a debate. Um, well, just using school resources, um, I, th I think we can we can help uh, CASA quite a bit with the resources that we have, whether it's um, through just using our public space, informational, um, getting the information out about CASA meetings, uh, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Ms. McCary? Our approach needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be multi-pronged. I think our prevention services our prevention efforts really need to target the school as well as the community. In terms of the school, we currently have no standardized coping skills, life skills, drug curriculum in the district. There is one that is excellent, that is evidence-based, that has been around forever called Life Skills. It runs five dollars a student. In terms of the community level, what I'd like to do is spearhead with CASA's help the training of 200 community members in a program called Mental Health First Aid. It is an evidence-based program that has great data. It's based upon the model of the CPR class, where you go, go, day, you learn CPR. This, you go, you learn the signs, 
of a mental health and substance abuse crisis and you learn how to intervene. And it's open to community members. There's a program that's specific for adolescents and there's a program that's specific for adults. We can easily train 200 community members at the cost of $16 a person. So we're talking about high impact, relatively low cost. When you look at substance abuse prevention from an economic analysis, for every $1 that you spend, you actually save $10 long term. So again, it's something that I think the district should be committed to and there's data behind doing it. Thank you, Ms. McCary. Um, and the next question, Mr. Stanker will answer this one first. Please speak to the issue of the implementation of the IB program rather than the AP program um, and your opinion as to whether you would see the IB program continue solely or would AP programs also have a place? I guess the AP is advanced placement. And I'm assuming IB is international baccalaureate. Thank you. All right, I've heard of that. I, I don't really pay much attention to that stuff, I'm sorry. For my, for my feelings about um, placement, okay, this is how I was in high school. We had uh, split sessions one year because there were so many of us in 1970. So we started school at eight and went to like 4.30 or something. So I took classes the whole day. By the time I was done in third year, I had enough credits I could just leave. But I went to the fourth year of school, and I graduated with six credits in history, I think, maybe five and a half in English, something like that, because we had electives, three years of Spanish, two years of Latin, all kinds of stuff. And then I went to college, and I got my education there. I feel learning, I loved learning. I thought learning was great. I didn't want to get the learning over with so that I could get out. See, learning was for its own sake. Benjamin Franklin said, if you empty your purse into your head, no one can take it from you. And this is something that stuck with me. I would like any opportunity to learn. Now, advanced placement is for what purpose? If it's at the right moment to learn it, great. If it's not at the right moment, if it's just to like push you forward, that means we don't have a better alternative. That's what I'm worried about. Thank you, Mr. Stanko. Mr. Madden. Um, so from where I, where I teach, where we use the advanced placement program, and, and so I'm much more familiar with the advanced placement program. Um, and I think um, that there, there, I think in many cases, there's a lot of overlap between the advanced placement program and the AP program. And the course that I'm most familiar with is AP American History. Um, that's what I've been teaching now for a number of years. And just watching my daughter go through the IB uh, American History course, there certainly is a, a lot of overlap. And for certain courses, I do think that they can run together, um, both the AP and IB. And my daughter will be taking the AP exam as many of the classes classmates were as well, and I don't think you can, it's one or the other in that, for that particular course. For a lot of other courses, I think the curriculum is probably a little bit different, um, and the approach might be a little bit different, and I think in those particular cases um, that if, if there is the opportunity at no extra cost to the district um, in terms of having extra sections, I mean, if you, have, you can have one ID section and one AP section, and uh, one, one ID bio and, and an AP bio, um, depending on what the, what the uh, demand of students is and what, what the enrollment would be in each case. So I think in many cases you can run one AP and one ID, uh, and I think in other cases there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, I'm saying stop, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Um, Ms. McCary. Sure. I'm supportive of both the IP and AP programs. I'd like to see both preserved in the high school. From what I've heard, um, it does not appear, it appears that our costs have already been incurred in terms of um, implementing the IP program. So at this point, if it's not costing the taxpayer any more, I think we're better off giving students ample option to pick what type of learning works best for them. Thank you, Ms. McCary. Ms. Vizza. Um, I have the perspective of being a um, mother of a graduate who is now in her second year of college who 
um, was the last cohort of solely AP. Um, now um, her siblings who are in 11th grade are IP, IB students. Um, the, the AP curriculum didn't hurt my daughter. She was a very high achiever. She probably would have been an IB diploma candidate if she was part of the cohort. Um, so the jury is out for me right now in terms of what I think of IB is effective or not. My children are doing very well. They don't come home complaining how tough it is or hard, but they really are engaged in, in the curriculum. Um, my son, who is a history buff and an English buff, um, he's taking the IB sections of that, and um, he appreciates the deep conversation and the broad conversations that IB tends to provide. Um, I agree with my uh, fellow trustees that I think we should give kids um, ample options and ample, ample opportunities and choices. Um, there's some limitations to IB in terms of um, if you take biology, it's a two-year commitment. Although you can drop to you can drop out of the two year, but you don't get the, the certificate. Um, uh, my daughter is taking the second year of IB Bio, but my son is um, not going to continue with physics, and he's interested in taking the IB Bio course. Um, uh, my daughter and my son are both taking AP exams. Um, so for some families, I think it's um, valuable the AP credits that the kids can attain, bring them to college, and save some money for them. So I think, um, again, if it isn't costing us anymore, if we do have staff here that is already trained to deliver AP, I think we should um, do our best to try and accommodate that in, in future budgets and in future models. Thanks, Ms. Mesa, you're welcome. And now we're gonna switch to a question from the podium, and Mr. Madden will take this question first. I wanna thank all four of you for running. It's a very hard and not often publicly rewarding job, so really thank you all for taking the time and wanting to do this for all of us. Um, I'm Pooja Vieira, I live in St. Clair, I have two kids in the district, and my question is, what experience or skills do you bring to the board that aren't there now, and how do you round out the board, and um, why is this needed? Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller. Okay, um, I think I bring uh, a uh, unique perspective from having uh, worked in other school districts um, and I can just give a, and also having served as a trustee in another school district and I can just give a, a couple of examples um, when um, this past I guess it was this past summer um, the board was intending to put up a bond uh, for uh, a vote in December of 2017. It was about a $20 million infrastructure bond. And I remember back in 2013 when we put up a bond, there was a, a tremendous amount of community input in the, these committees uh, to examine the projects. And this hadn't gone through this time. Well, it didn't go through that process this time. And I explained that at a couple of board meetings that a bond had just been defeated in Great Neck, where I teach, um, because I didn't think there had been enough community input. And they actually put the brakes on it. Um, from my experience in Northport, uh, I remember a couple of years ago during the annual organization meeting, uh, they were doing committee appointments, and I noted uh, during public comment that the audit committee for the district uh, was made up exclusively of board members. And that the way many districts, in particular Northport, do it is they include community members as well. And I made that suggestion, which was taken up by the board. Um, so I think having that, um, you know, having that experience in other districts and seeing how other things are done in other places uh, it can be very useful. And uh, also just reporting on school boards and also on government boards, uh, you get an idea of the importance of process and welcoming public input. Um, and I think that experience is will be useful as well. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Um, Ms. McCary. Sure. Um, it's crazy to me that out of seven people on the board, there's nobody with a background in child development or mental health issues. This is not to say that the contributions the current board members bring aren't valuable, they are, but I think we need somebody who understands the social, emotional, developmental, and academic needs of all children of all ages. I also have a background in educational research I was mentored by Carol Dweck, who is the researcher behind Growth Mindset. Um, she's the first person who actually talked to me about being a psychologist. I think that would be very valuable here, my background in education and assessment. I also bring something else. 
our current board members, they don't have children, their children are out of the district or they're transitioning out of the district. I also think this is what separates me from my other candidates. I have a second grader. I have 10 years left in this district. As we need young, we need moms of young children on this board, because what's going to happen is we're gonna have nobody representing those early elementary school experiences. Elementary school students spend more time in that building than you do in the middle school or the high school. And if you look at the total student population of North Shore, elementary school students make up half of that. So we need to have our fair representation. Thanks, Ms. McCary. Ms. Biza. Um, I think that I bring um, a unique set of skills to the board in that um, I have a pretty rich business background. Um, I led um, teams um, to implement technology initiatives and uh, three fairly big um, companies of three different sectors. So it, um, I was required to kind of um, educationally shift my views to different uh, industries in that in that regard. And I think I did pretty well. Um, I had to manage budgets. I had to manage people. I had to manage expectations, which were oftentimes uh, reasonable and unreasonable. Um, and in line with certain uh, corporate um, or not-for-profit uh, expectations and outcomes. So um, I bring that to the table. Uh, and then as a flip side, uh, after I left that and after I had my family, I decided to enter the field of social work. Um, so I had that basis of experience, uh, experience working both uh, in a clinical setting at North Shore LIJ. And, um, and I also have a pretty significant K-12 perspective um, with regard to my uh, volunteerism and, and um, work with the CPSC and CSC community here at, at North Shore as a parent member on the, um, uh, of those committees um, and as part of um, planning and review of the special ed department. I'm often in each elementary school building, middle school and high school, um, serving as a parent member at CSC meetings where we develop IEPs. I'm also as co-president of coordinating Thank council, um, I deal with um, the presidents of each building's PTO. So I kind of had my ear to the ground as to what's going on in each one of those school buildings. Thank you, Ms. Bibble. And um, Mr. Sternberg. All right, not to diminish anyone here uh, that's running against me, because I'm really impressed with everyone. All right. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I think that, you know, we should all just get elected. <laughs> <laughs> I have you all beat because I've been a trial attorney, I've been a teacher, you know, all teachers have psychological training, I have the experience with children, I've been a drug outreach worker, I ran a program, I, you know, I can't even list it all when it comes to me and the work I've done for children, for parents, for grandparents, the issues that we face, I just feel like I'm anointed. I know what's happening. When it comes to building repairs, I've built buildings from the bottom to the top. And somebody's going to give us, oh, it's going to cost us this much to fix that. I've installed furnaces. Let me tell you, I am hands-on and I am self-reliant. And I know all the aspects of what happens. The, I had a, one job as a teacher. I had so much trouble that I went to the school board in February and I said, I can't work under this building principal. I was only there for six months. I said, look, at the end of this year, I'm resigning. I'll finish out the year and I'm gone. That was in February. In March, they had his resignation. He was out. See, I know things about teaching. I know what makes teachers good. I know what makes schools good, all types of schools. Thank you, Mr. Thank um, and now we're going to switch to a question from the card. Ms. McCary is going to answer first. Um, what do you feel is the biggest obstacle to North Shore schools in the near future, and how will you work to mitigate negative impact? Mm. Can I pick two? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think um, I'm going to go with two answers. One, I think we have this life of decommissioning that we don't really know what's going to happen, right? LIPA is challenging the assessment with the county. 
the county is probably going to sell us out and probably going to be the sacrificial lamb and how that's going to affect, affect our taxes we really need to take a long view on that so that's one issue and of course uh, coupled with our american water issue i think uh, that, that's a big problem the second issue that i think we really need to look at is the, so the mental health and substance use issue in the school and we talked a lot about it today. I'm not going to reiterate my points, but I think those two issues should be our main focus. Thank you, Ms. McKenzie. Ms. Rizzo. Um, I'll agree because it's the big giant elephant in the room is that um, life in American water are really going to create some um, um, fiscal holes for us in the future. Um, what I'd like to see is um, the, the school district um, collaborating and creating a team to, uh, which they've done with WAC, but with certain community civic groups and other endeavors that are going on to um, uh, address those and, and fight those with Albany. And they led, you know, the, the legal suits are another matter that the district has to um, contend with. But um, for us to um, be able to advocate on behalf of our school district via WAC to Albany where we need to, I think, is something that we need to continue. Um, again, the social emotional training of our kids, K through 12. Um, there is a new mental health initiative um, and guidance initiative K through 12 that we're going to be implementing that the state has uh, designed for us to, in the district to implement. Um, and uh, I think we need to support that. I need to, we need to reorient um, our mental health interventions in the school district from reactive to proactive and risk prevention. So um, I think that it's something that would be very worthwhile to um, invest in in our school district. Thanks, Ms. Wizard. Mr. Steingart. We're never going to have a bad school here. We're never going to have bad schools. This is a great school district. We can allocate as we need for what's essential. You know, we're going to maybe have to cut some frills, in my opinion. I see things that can be done that maybe you're out of the box you don't think about but I was an elementary school teacher and at the eighth grade level I taught every subject we started the morning with Tai Chi okay we, I taught them music we, it was a small school I had to do it I was there for lunch but a kindergarten teacher is smart and able to do things so a kindergarten teacher can actually teach Mandarin Yes, and other school districts do stuff like this. It's elementary level, Mandarin. Think out of the box. There are ways. I don't want to lose anything, but I want to use things where they're really needed. That makes a difference. We were really spoiled when I was a kid. We had so much of our taxes paid by the lighting company. And people seized on that. And we added here and we added there. That's going to shrink away, but the schools are not going to go downhill, and that's one of the reasons why I want to meet with people, and we're going to talk about what's essential, and that's what we're going to work for, and it's not these bills that matter. I'm going to, I'm going to quote the little prince. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. Mr. Madden. Um, I think a uh, few issues um, that we have to be concerned about. Um, as um, colleagues up here mentioned, certainly the financial pressures and the economic pressures that uh, residents here will be feeling and may be feeling with regards to LIPA and also the water company issue. I agree with uh, Lisa about partnering with uh, local organizations uh, in the civics on the, on the water company issue. Um, and I think with regards to LIPA, um, we have to continue uh, the, the aggressive legal strategy that we've, uh, that we've been employing over the last several years in trying to prevent a more significant tax uh, shift over to class one residents. Um, I think the other issues though that are important, um, that the, uh, the other obstacles um, are the, one of the, one is the issues that were raised by the group Move Together, um, where several students very eloquently spoke uh, at a couple of board meetings, uh, maybe about six weeks uh, or two months ago, uh, concerning issues of uh, discrimination uh, and insensitivity uh, to various groups of students. And I think that issue 
things in hand with what I mentioned before about 32% of students not feeling a sense of belonging. Um, and I think we really need to, to work to address that issue in, in the five-year strategic plan, uh, the goals of it. I'm very happy to see uh, that diversity um, and addressing issues of diversity uh, is one of, those, one of those particular goals. Thank you, Mr. Mann. And next question will be from the microphone and Ms. Bizzle will answer first. Hi. Oh my God. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for running. My name is Lisa Cashman. I live in Seacliff. And I'm interested in your take on success metrics for the district. In particular, um, is our is this is I'll read my question so I don't think it's late. Um, is the caliber of colleges in the North Shore High School graduates the go-to success metric for the district? If yes, why? If no, what do you consider a more meaningful success metric? You know, success is defined very differently by different people and uh, different families. Um, I have a daughter who goes to a very, um, she goes to an Ivy League school. She worked really hard to get there. That was her goal. Um, and to, to her, that was her success metric. It wasn't necessarily mine. My success metric is I want my daughter to be happy and fulfilled in whatever she chooses to do and wherever she chooses to be and wherever she chooses to learn. Um, I think North Shore prepares kids to find their, six, their own success metric. Um, if you're looking for something more concrete, like how do we define North Shore success, um, those, are the, the, those are the metrics that I look to. Do my children come home feeling fulfilled? Are they happy when they come home? Do they discuss what they're learning in school and that they're happy about it? Those are my success metrics. They may not be yours, they may not be the community's, but those are mine. Um, and I would hope that for every kid, that they would feel happy and fulfilled to be here and accepted and safe. To me, that's a, that, that, that's a pretty significant success metric. Thank you, Ms. Visit. Mr. Sternberg. I think about uh, in Plato's Republic, the story uh, Socrates is telling about people that live in a cave, and they give each other these uh, prizes and stuff. Well, who can say, oh, look at the, sh you know, they're watching shadows on a wall because there's a road behind them and there's a big fire behind them. And, and they give out prizes for the one that can identify, oh, there's that one going here about his business and that one going there. And Socrates says, well, let's suppose we take this guy out of the cave. Is he going to rec recognize the world? And he's not because it's too bright. And you're going to have to take him over, and you're going to say, look at the shadow on the ground. Does that look like the shadow on the cave wall? And you go, oh, yeah, that looks a little bit like what I know. And I'll take you over the pond, and I'm going to look, look in the reflection and see that there's like a mirror image. Does that teach you anything? And now let's look at the sky, and let's see what the sun really looks like. And then let's put you back in the cave, and everyone's going to think you're crazy when you describe the world. So people in the cave are going to say, you know, I'd be better off dead than thinking the way that crazy guy is talking. So what was the story? That we learn by degrees to go from the world of becoming into that of being, into the brightest and best of being. Those are the words. That's what I want for every child in our school. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. Mr. Madden. Um, I, I teach in a uh, high school that is uh, considered a very high achieving school that's often uh, ranked uh, near the top in almost every U.S. news and world report, niche magazine, uh, online magazine, whatever it is. And I think we have to really try to avoid using those types of measures, those rankings, and also the caliber of, of colleges. I know in, in my uh, districts that's, you know, the, the kids often just, you know, apply to, they go to the, end up going to the schools that have the best reputations um, and that have the, the, um, uh, the most clout, I guess, and they're not necessarily the right fit. And I think we have to really discourage students from just going for a name uh, with the college and really looking at what is best for them. And I agree with uh, Lisa 100%. I mean, the measure that I use, the metric that I use uh, for what sort of education my kids are getting is, 
What are they talking about when they come home? How do things in Africa go about school? Why are they curious about um, the things that are, are going on around them um, when they come home? And so we had this great discussion in social studies class, or we had this great discussion in English, uh, whatever it is. And I know that's difficult uh, oftentimes for a community, it's just simply because they're not seeing that aspect of it, and these other measures become the measures that, that we tend to focus on, and uh, I think we need to try to get away from that. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Ms. McCary. Sure. I think it's one measure, but I think it's a very flawed measure. There are too many unknown factors determining who gets accepted and who doesn't. We know privilege is one of them, access private tutors, SAT classes, uh, missions consultants, makes a big difference in who gets that big letter and who gets that small letter from the college. I think a better measure of students' ability is whether they're able to successfully transition from whatever program that they get into, whether that is college, a competitive one or a community college, whether that is a technical program, the military. Once they leave here, are they able to successfully transition and complete that program? It's one thing to get accepted. It's another thing to finish strong. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to tell you that we do have to wrap up by 10, um, but I think we should be able to get at least one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, and this question is going to go to Mr. Stanko first. How do you view the arts and arts your education, and are you going to defend the arts during budget constraints? Okay, so I was, uh, one of my jobs, I was, um, I came out of college in 1976. By the way, there were 20,000 unemployed teachers in Nassau County. I really wanted to teach, so I did whatever I had to do. I had a maternity leave replacement job. I was a math teacher. And the head of the English department broke his ankle, and he sees uh, his teacher apathy time. Uh, Tony, we need someone to direct the play. Uh, would you do it? I said, sure. I got a play. I said, okay, uh, we'll do Thornton Wilder's The Skin of Our Teeth. And these are the kids. They want to be in the yearbook, and they want to be known as the, the thespians and stuff like that. And here I am, the math teacher, for one year. And I'm doing this, the, the, the school play for the spring. This is it. This is the big play. And we are like, 85, 90% done, we're almost gonna, we're gonna be on stage. And these kids, that, you know, they look at me and they say, Mr. Stanko, what is this play about? And I said, that's why we're doing it. Okay, do I care about the arts? What do you think? Just to decide based on that alone. I think it's enough. Thank you, Mr. Stanko. Mr. Madden. Um, yes, I, I will fight to defend uh, our programs. <laughs> um, <laughs> last um, and I don't know, I'm sure some of you were at the uh, small ensemble concert last night um, at the high school, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, the work that the music educators in this district do uh, is so valuable uh, to the students who go through that program. Uh, anyone who saw the, um, the uh, musical we were blind uh, would agree um, with the performing arts as well. And I think across the board, whether it's visual or performing arts, uh, these, these programs are absolutely essential, uh, and not just at the high school level. Um, I'm just saying that because my daughter was in the musical and the uh, concerts last night, but at all levels. And it's always been uh, a tremendous experience for my kids going through. I will also say that I will fight to, fight to defend other programs as well, other than the arts. I think uh, co-curricular uh, programs are uh, very important. If you look at something like the robotics program, and you have to have um, opportunities for students with different interests and different strengths and give them, um, give them those options and also just the option to experiment. Um, you know, some students want to try 
painting and it doesn't work out and then you can move into the visual arts. I, I think that's a, it's so, so important to our educational program. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Um, Ms. McCary, one word, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Ms. Rizzo. Uh, I agree with my uh, candidate colleagues here and my family is we're a huge supporter of the arts. Um, my daughter was involved in uh, vocal performance ensembles. She is a um, high-level cello player, and she's carried those over to her college career, um, work, uh, singing in a gospel choir at school, and um, she's got a very big cello taking up most of her dorm room, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure her roommate truly appreciates. But she uses it and pulls it out at times of you know, normal collegial student um, collegiate stress. Um, she loves it, um, and it's because the, of how it was fostered here at North Shore from third grade till she was a senior. Um, and we've supported that. My daughter is involved in the fine arts department. Um, she's found photography to be her passion, and we support her in that goal. And whether she takes it with her to college or not, doesn't really matter. She's doing something pro-social. She's part of an art uh, honor society. She's in the yearbook. She engages in things where she can utilize to carry over her skills in art, and um, and I think it's important. And I cry every time I go to a musical ensemble performance, and I don't even have any kids playing anymore. Um, uh, Gina Martone, she'll testify that I go to these things. She'll be like, "Why are you here?" I'm like, "Because I enjoy it," um, and it's satisfying for me to see. Um, the children of many of my friends who are incredible uh, student musicians go on to um, carry out their dream to be professional musicians, and we have many of those, and I think we should be very proud of our program and what we've produced out of it. So yes, yeah, I would fight to maintain it. Thank you, Ms. Rizzo. And this would be our final question, so from the podium, if you need me. And um, Mr. Madden will take this question first. Amy Dyer. From experience, I want to thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. You're not warning us off. No, no. I'm not warning you off. But I'm listening to you, <laughs> listening to you tonight, um, makes me confident that we will still have excellent stewards working for our school. So thank you for volunteering your time. Um, I want to ask you on a scale of one to ten. I know how difficult it is sometimes to separate yourself as a parent and um, being a board member and making decisions for the students of the schools. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the importance of your own children or children's experiences in the North Shore schools informing and informing the decisions you will consider on behalf of all of the students of North Shore schools? And please explain why you chose that number. So on um, 10 is of greatest importance? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to say a two or a three. Um, it's going to be down towards the bottom. And the reason, I think one of the most difficult things in um, being a you know, school board trustee, a village board trustee, is trying to maintain impartiality. And when you are, when I've been asked, well, when you are a, uh, when you're a parent, uh, there's, a, there's a conflict of interest when you serve on a school board as a parent, because certainly the con your concern about your child is more important than anything else. Um, but you have a responsibility to the community to set aside your personal interests uh, for the interests of the community and in the interests of the school. And it's the same thing with people that you know. Um, when you serve on a local board, you're going to know a large portion of the community, and certainly those are the people you're going to be talking to quite a bit. And you have to insulate yourself from that pressure as well and make sure that you get input from a variety of stakeholders and from all stakeholders. And uh, I think that's a very difficult thing to do on uh, local boards. I think it's much easier to do if, when you're in Congress simply because you don't have that connection, uh, that personal connection to people. And there's no connection more personal than your children. But you really have to set that aside. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Ms. McCary. You may think that's a really hard question, actually. I was going to say a two or a three. Um, 
as this process has been going on for the last couple of months, I've been speaking to lots of different people in the community, and I've realized that my experiences with my daughter are as unique as your experiences with your children. And to base decisions on your own child when you're too emotionally invested to see objectively is really a mistake for the district. So I think moving forward, while it would be a challenging task, you have to put your own child aside and look at the needs of all children. Thank you, Ms. Visit. I'm going to place it as, as a one, quite frankly. Um, I think it's a board member's fiduciary responsibility to um, put the um, interests of every student at the forefront of their decisions. Um, and I would go as far as saying the students, putting the um, needs of our staff, faculty and staff as well, um, and, and the community, um, and the needs and values and, and wants of the community. Um, that, I think that's primary, and um, I, I would give it a one. Thank you, Ms. Vivid. Mr. Stanko. Um, I want to comment, first of all, to what in this letter of recommendation is this in it, the Mr. Stanko loves children. I'm like talking to him, and I'm like, why are you writing this? Can't you talk about how I'm an effective teacher, and I do this, and I do that? And he said, he says, look, you know, this guy actually is great in underwear. He says, I know this. I don't know what you do in that room up there, <laughs> but I know you love children. So um, I don't know, like my children versus your children. All of them are 10. Okay, and by the way, the reason why I'm running for the board is for my children because I want to make sure I have one going into the junior high next year, one soon in the junior high, and if I can't see that the high school is a really safe environment when it comes to drug abuse, I'm leaving. I live in this district because I have familial obligations only. I, I could be in other places. I know a lot of places to live. But I have other uh, family members I have to take care of. But if I don't see it safe for my children, it will also be safe for your children. I'm going to leave. This is my great motivation. This is what worries me the most. And temporarily, I'm living pretty close to the high school here. And when it's, you know, summer's coming and I hear the noises, I know what's going on. And really, it's. In my opinion, not that I'm going to turn 64 by the time this election is over, or that I have a child that's 19 months at the same time. We'll have to figure that one out. But the thing is, <laughs> I got a future to worry about, mm. and that future includes you. You'll be covered, and you'll be covered. Thank you, Mr. Stanka. And now we are going to move on to closing statements. So just a reminder to the candidates, you'll each be given two minutes for your closing statements. And we're going to begin with Mr. Madden. Okay, uh, thank you very much to the League of Women Voters uh, for um, moderating the event. And uh, thank you to everyone who's sitting up here with me. It's not an easy thing to do. And thank you to the audience for coming out tonight. Um, Someone asked me uh, the other day how many school board meetings I've attended since moving here in late 2010. And I said I've missed probably three or four a year. And quickly doing the math came up as more than 100. Uh, pretty sad, I joked, adding that to the probably better things I could have been doing with my time. And uh, there probably were certainly for a lot of those meetings that I've attended. Um, but the reason I've attended so many meetings and reported on a large percentage of them and served on the North Board School District Board and taught teachers at the graduate school level and became an educator 28 years ago is because I believe, aside from the family, the public school is the most important institution we have in our society. It is, as Horace Mann said, the great equalizer of the conditions of man, the balance wheel of the social machinery. And if you build the whole passage, you know he didn't mean it in some sort of communistic way. He meant that it provides opportunity. And that's ultimately what we are here for, to create opportunity and to remove the barriers to opportunity. 
over those barriers are social pressures, the self-fulfilling prophecy of the crushed self-esteem, income level, or prejudice and intolerance. The world school system fosters an environment and culture of learning that will enable each individual child to thrive and to have the adaptive skills and mindset to be successful and happy in life and to be a good citizen. I'm running because I believe that I have an educational philosophy and an approach to governing based on my many different experiences over the years that will help us move, move towards that end for every student. And I also understand the economic pressures this community is feeling and that we always have to make choices that take into account those pressures. I grew up in Glenhead, having moved here in 1974, my parents in part looking for a better education for their children, and I spent the next 15 years of my life here. I returned 20 years later for similar reasons, a great education for my children. I'm sorry, Jim, Jim let's go very quickly. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Um, so does that, does that mean I get an extra 20 seconds? The central question in this selection is what types of schools do we want to have? Nurture has always prided itself on being student-centered and focused on educating the whole child. But to really achieve that, we need something on the board who is able to speak definitively about the social, emotional, developmental, and academic needs of all children of all ages. I want to be that person. I've spent the last 15 years splitting my time between higher education and the psychology community. In those two worlds, I have gained a wealth of knowledge that I can bring to the board table. Experience related to diversity, testing and learning, assessment, curriculum. But my greatest asset is that I can be a relentless advocate for you. Over the last two months, I've met and spoken to many residents to get an idea of what matters most to you. I met Kevin of Glenhead, a vice principal who wants to see the district embrace more portfolio assessment. I met John of Obukfo, a retiree whose children graduated decades ago, who's worried about the double burden of his American water bills and increased property taxes. And I spoke to Maria of our greenhouse. She wants the district to help that garden grow both literally and figuratively. If you elect me, I promise I will fight for Kevin and Maria and John. I promise I'll fight for you, but most importantly, I promise I'll fight for your children's education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCoy. Ms. Visa. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, the Coordinating Council, led by Denise Vizza and the League of Women Voters for, mm -hmm. what's so funny? Oh, Denise Reiner, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to the ring. Um, she's probably cursing me now because I didn't help her out this season. Um, for, uh, we, for leaving this particular venue for us to be able to uh, explain our views of school and for you to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, my professional background in business, social work, and mental health, and an institutional knowledge of district process, coupled with my related experiences as an engaged community member, I believe can provide informed, thoughtful, comprehensive, and balanced assistance to our recently appointed superintendent and other school board members as they continue their transitional work in the pursuit of excellence in the North Shore schools that is student-centered and purposeful. I have no other agenda than keeping the focus on our students and our ability to be responsive to their needs and while being accountable to the broader North Shore community with transparency. I personally value the skills of collaboration, sensitivity, and responsiveness to the needs of others, resourcefulness, and flexibility in the face of planned and unplanned change. Those attributes have served me well in developing meaningful relationships in a host of settings and will continue to do so in the future. I believe we've clearly demonstrated an ability to connect with a variety of stakeholders and will be able to effectively represent and reflect the diverse voices and values of the North Shore community and meet the myriad challenges to local, publication, local um, public education that exists today. Whomever you choose to represent the, as your voice in the community, and I sincerely hope I'm one of them, we are lucky to have qualified, motivated individuals who are willing to volunteer their time to the North Shore schools. Thank you for listening.
And you can find out even more about us on northshoreschools.org under the Board of Ed Candidates section. So thank you all for coming out. I look forward to speaking with you outside of this venue in the next two weeks. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Starnfeld. So I'm going to Michigan in a couple of days. And when, the, when you're voting, I won't even be here. Um, I, I'm not uh, really a campaigner. Uh, I refuse to go to the cocktail party now I've got, got from. I will never talk about the welfare of children with a drink in my hand. I'm sorry. It's just not my personality. I will probably have said things that have offended some people, and that's too bad. I am a reform type of candidate. I really want to see a certain type of change in attitude amongst all the people, and the parents in particular, if they want to support me, they can, but I don't have any signs to put up. So if you want, you got to buy some poster paper and you put Stonko and Trusty and you get some crayons because I'm not going to do it. I just, I'm a Quaker. I don't care. If I, I want to win for the sake of what I would like to do and give to you, but I cannot play that game. I even once was a political science major. I was so naive. I thought we were going to study about good government. And this professor looks at me and says, I don't care what you do with power. I'm just going to show you how to get it. So I changed my major. I just thought that's so disgusting. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I'd rather be a happy fool and go through this life, and that will be fine. Uh, but I don't need to fool myself. I like to know what's the truth around me. This is important. Education for me is not how to make money. It's how to be happy. We've got 7 billion people in the world. A lot of them don't have as much money as we do, and they're still happy. I've witnessed some of them. So I've learned some things about life, the secrets of life. We, before 130 years ago, when the captains of industry said, we need to train children to work for us, we had a better idea of what education was for. I want to bring you back to that idea. Thank you, Mr. Stanko. <laughs> and so in closing, I um, would like to thank the candidates. Um, wonderful job tonight and to say what a fortunate community we are to have you know four people who run themselves for work for this role. So we could give them another round of applause, I think. Ms. Reiner will probably also remind you, but as the League of Women Voters, we need to remind you that you can vote on May 15th in this election, and we would really encourage you to do so. I want to thank the community members who came out tonight for coming out tonight and to being so interested and involved to want to listen to what the candidates had to say. I want to remind you that this event was recorded and for you to consider telling your family and friends to look for the recording which should be up within the next few days on the high school uh, parent organization website and the Glenwood Landing um, website. And please take what you've heard today out into the community and start uh, talking. And um, yes, uh, talking about all of the issues that have been brought up and sharing your views. So again, thank you for coming out and a big, a big huge thank you to the League of Women Voters who came out today and did an excellent job. Good night.